Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you are doing well. My name is Reza. And uh, today we are very pleased to have uh, Patrick Donnelly with us uh, as our invited speaker. So Patrick uh, is an environmental planner and resource manager uh, with over 40 years of experience in watershed and ecosystem-based management. Um, he has a numerous experience in working at provincial, municipal, and private consulting and nonprofit uh, environmental organizations. Um, uh, so Patrick has joined the City of London in 2004 as an urban watershed uh, program manager. And he's also the founder and the director of the Lake Huron Coastal Center with over 20 years of um, environmental uh, work. Um, um, Patrick holds a master's degree in science uh, focused on hydrology and geomorphology. And he's also a registered professional planner. And his interests include uh, the potential impacts of climate change on water resources. And uh, uh, he's uh, uh, actively involved in this, uh, this work and developing uh, uh, adaptation strategies. Um, he is involved in community education and promoting environmental stewardship uh, over his entire career. And um, with that said, uh, again, we are very happy to have um, Patrick with us. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, with that, Patrick, the stage is yours. Thank you again for accepting this invitation. Great, thank you very much, Reza. Yes, it's a it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, this presentation and uh, our conversation with Reza has gone on for probably six months or so. Originally, I think I was going to be in person, but uh, here we are in in the new world order, and uh, uh, happy to be here. Um, certainly, the um, the work I'm going to describe to you is the work that we are undertaking at the City of London with regards to climate change. And I'll maybe just uh, take this moment to share the screen. And I will ask Reza just to make sure that you are seeing the correct screen there. Yes. Just a, yes, a thumbs up. Good. Yeah, super. So um, uh, the City of London has a, a long history with the engineering department, uh, as, uh, engineering faculty at the uh, the City of London. So certainly uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to a, a number of you today. Um, we also recognize at the city that with over 40,000 students at Western, you are your own community. And the work that we're doing talking about climate change uh, affects all the communities in London. So certainly Western is a, a significant one. Uh, what I've got for you today is about a dozen slides just to set the scene as to the process of what we're involved in right now. And this is uh, fairly early on with the uh, climate emergency action plan we're referring to it as. And uh, that dozen uh, slides will give you a, a quick overview and then we'll dive down into a little bit more deeper discussion with regards to uh, answering about six or seven questions. Number one is, is this an emergency? Uh, number two is, what is the urgency? Number three is the impacts on London, what we can do about it, what the city is doing, and then what you can do, uh, especially what you at Western and the uh, civil engineering, civil and engineer, uh, environmental engineering department. So that's kind of the format and uh, be happy to answer questions at the end. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Reza to figure out exactly how we do that, whether it's through the chat box or, uh, or uh, verbally, it might be easier through the chat box. I might suggest, especially if you've got burning questions and I see a heads nodding. So yeah, we'll go that route. So the, uh, the slide in front of you gives you an idea of the ways that the city is currently uh, releasing information, providing information and engaging with the public. And with those four boxes, I'll just mention on the left-hand side is our Get Involved London um, uh, site. And that is something that we're actively populating and updating with information uh, which provides uh, people with a, an opportunity to provide feedback, complete some surveys that we put up there and share ideas. The uh, top left, a direct consultation, I guess we could say is what I'm doing right now today with, with the presentation. Uh, the top right 
is a, uh, a simulator, which is an interesting one. It is not on the website yet, but it will be in the next week or 10 days. And it's basically an opportunity for you to play the role of city council or senior staff and say, what would a climate action plan look like? Where do we need to focus our attention? And it's a very very interesting simulator produced by a, a nonprofit environmental group, which we have accessed as well as a number of other municipalities are using just to give people a handle on what's feasible and what will make the difference when we are trying to, to go to a net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So that's a, an interesting tool. I'll just highlight that you may find uh, a lot of uh, interest, uh, especially with your students. And last but not least, education and community Project Neutral is something I'll mention a little later on when we dive down a little bit deeper. It's an actual um, tool, again, online for you to calculate your household greenhouse gas emissions. And as many people have said before, you cannot manage anything unless you can measure it. So that actually gives you a measurement tool for your own greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the other ones uh, listed there are different opportunities, which again, we'll talk about. So climate action consists of two items, mitigation, which is reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation, which is the adaptation to the extreme weather we're experiencing now, as well as what's projected into the future. So our city council in December of 2019 set a new goal for greenhouse gas to get net zero by 2050. And that's a very audacious goal but it's also one that is, is very much required. And you'll, you'll hear federal governments talking about those types of goals as well. So where are we with our greenhouse gas emissions? And again, this is in the mitigation side of it, trying to reduce the future impacts of climate change. We are around 15% below 1990 levels of greenhouse gas. And that 1990 level is the benchmark we use in calculating greenhouse gas emissions. The other thing I'll just point out here is the City of London has done a very good job in, in actually measuring greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got a number of years of data already in the analysis that we can use for making those types of assumptions. And so those uh, that, th that mark has been met. You'll see we are looking at 37% uh, decrease in greenhouse gas emissions below the 1990 level by the year 2030. And that's, a, again, a, a fairly aggressive but necessary step for us to get to net zero by 2050. Where are these greenhouse gas emissions coming from? This is basically a, a cross section of the different sectors. And you'll see that personal vehicles in black is by far the largest uh, contribution of greenhouse gases. This is using 2019 data. However, that and the second bar, which is the green one, which is the housing energy for heating and energy used for cooling are by far the two largest greenhouse gas emissions in the city of London. So when you look at the different sectors, the very small one is municipal operations, which obviously the city has a direct control over. The other one that we have direct control over is methane from landfills. And, and the rest of them are really our community, our businesses, our institutions. You'll see in, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, red category, educational hospitals. These are things that the city where I work has a indirect uh, influence over. So very much this is a, a plan for the entire community and, and uh, with the requirement that we need participation from everyone. When we get down to the household uh, level, you can see that 50% or just under 50% is from vehicle gasoline use. So that plus the bar on the or the graph on the right with the blue uh, section being 31% natural gas home heating, there's 80% of your household greenhouse gas emissions are from the vehicle you use and from the way that you heat and cool your house. So again, significant. Uh, when we talk about the average London home emits about 10.5 tons per year. So there's a focus that we have to address in our action plan. So on the adaptation side, why are we doing this? Well, here's an example for London. 
using uh, the criteria of a very hot days, so days over 30 degrees, if we continue on as we are right now and not making energy conservation and greenhouse gas emissions a priority, we are looking at increasing the number of hot days from our existing about a week and a half of hot days, 12 days, into the future being almost two months of hot days, which is over 30 degree days. Significant warming, if you want to call it that. We generally use the, uh, the, the, the terminology uh, warmer, wetter, and wilder weather is what we're looking at. And this is certainly an example if we are doing business as usual with regards to our greenhouse gas emissions, this is what our future looks like. So this is something that we, we have to obviously keep in mind. As far as rainfall goes, we know that the wilder weather is giving us more extreme weather events, short duration rainfall, and certainly in this case, overwhelming our storm sewer system. So here, this is an example of flooding that is actually directly related to the inability of the surface water to get away in our storm water system. The other aspect that we do know because of a warmer uh, climate is our Great Lakes are not going to have the ice cover that they normally have, or certainly a reduced ice cover. And this is for anybody who does any traveling outside of London. This is the radar installation north of, uh, of London in Exeter showing the streamers or snow squalls coming off of Lake Huron. So the green and blue patches moving from top left, bottom right, giving us these uh, streamers of snow, which dump a lot of snow. In this example, this was back in 2010. It paralyzed the city for four days. Western was shut down. Fanshawe was shut down. Our, our uh, transit system was shut down. And the uh, it was coined Snowmageddon at the time. And this is what our future is likely going to look at with regards to snow uh, streamers and squalls coming off the Great Lakes. The other aspect is a change in our flooding. And this is our river flooding. This is the intersection of Windermere and Adelaide Street. For those of you that are familiar with the Waltzing Weasel Pub and Restaurant, this is a spot where frequent flooding because of the Thames River, but we're finding more and more it's winter flooding. So January of 2018 and, and uh, February of 2019, we had severe floods and these floods are, are no longer happening just in spring, they're happening uh, at all times of the year. So the impact that this has, these types of, of uh, weather events are increasing our, our insurance costs. And certainly at Western, uh, you'd be familiar with the Institute of Catastrophic Loss Reduction, which is a, a wonderful research facility, which uh, utilizes funds from the insurance industry to actually uh, operate. And you can see the red line here shows a very gradual but increasing trend as we continue to have these storms. So again, with the quick summary slides that I'm providing, here's what we are asking. Uh, the one item on the uh, Get Involved website is a discussion primer. And that discussion primer posts suggestions about actions that we're considering taking. And those, uh, those suggestions on actions are ones that we're wanting your input on. So item number two, what are the actions that we need to keep? Which ones need to be revised or removed and which ones need to be added? We also need to know. We also need to where, know where the university is with regards to assisting in that. And I'll just mention. I think somebody may not be muted on their mic. So if you could uh, mute your mic, that'd be great. So letting us know that, yeah, the role that the university can play, what your own plans are, and I know the university has has considerable plans. I believe the sustainability plan was done at the university uh, in 2012, and that's a 10 year plan. So getting to know how that uh, plan has been implemented and also how it fits into the work that we're doing here at the city. And obviously incorporating climate emergency actions into your plan. Uh, my last introductory slide here is just talking about what the um, discussion primer looks like. For those of you that have been in London for a while or know London, we went through a London plan exercise, which is basically our official plan for all the decisions being made in London by the city. And we use the same pillars, uh, how we live, how we green, how we move, how we grow and how we prosper to categorize the different actions. So if you're familiar with that process that was done for the London plan, we're, we're using that, recycling it, I guess, if you want to call it, for our discussion primer. So th those people that are only interested in transportation-related uh, actions focus right in on how we move. 
those people that are interested in new development and green green development standards can focus right in on how we grow. So that's the introduction. Now we'll dive down into a, a little bit deeper discussion as to what this all means for London. So I mentioned we the, the city council uh, in their wisdom uh, gave us a declaration in December 2019, which they referred to as a climate emergency. And as soon as that happens, the first question is, is this really an emergency? So the next series of slides gives you a bit more information as to why that is certainly something that's being uh, uh, being addressed. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with this whole idea that the temperature has been warming steadily over the last several decades. And this uh, animation certainly shows that with uh, going back from the 1800s, moving into the uh, more recent uh, decades and how the red temperatures are showing between one and two degree change in temperature with regards to globally. And these are certainly being impacted, especially in Canada because of the, uh, the impacts on the north, the areas that are not normally warm, areas that we don't get that direct sunlight uh, as much as we do in the southern latitudes. And that is specifically quite frightening with regards to that. So we know we've got a warmer climate. The uh, 2010s were the hottest decade on record. And certainly this shows the, the last, uh, last decade and how the rise in temperature. So we know this is, this is our future. We know that is, is something that's happening. You've all heard about the, uh, the Amazon forest fires and the impact that that has on, on, on stored carbon uh, from a global situation. Uh, the uh, deserts of uh, Australia uh, began to uh, move and, and uh, create more issues with regards to forest fires in that, in that country in the last few years. Uh, the smoke from those uh, events uh, are, are, were found to circle the, the earth and, and the globe and those impacts certainly impacted weather in other parts of the, of the country. So again, these are all examples of why we are calling an emergency. Uh, the irony of this photograph is it's an ESO gas station after a hurricane went through in Florida. And certainly with the gas, gasoline and the greenhouse gases that are, are caused by that extraction and use, uh, fueling the uh, hurricanes uh, and certainly demolishing this uh, uh, gas station. Again, a, a rather ironic situation that's uh, illustrated here. Uh, recently in, in Ottawa, uh, high winds uh, creating tornado uh, features and uh, weather events. And in this case, a crane that was collapsed on the roof. So again, these are the types of events that we're looking closely at because in London, we will be having these types of things happening with extreme weather events with regards to wind, snow and rain, certainly. Also heat uh, and the uh, advent of, uh, of uh, periods of, of high heat. Uh, we know that in Europe, there was many deaths associated with that. And in, uh, in Canada, Montreal was an example in the last decade where uh, heat waves have caused uh, uh, impacts to vulnerable people. And poor old Venice and their canals, certainly with sea level rise, those are uh, examples that we've seen from other uh, newspaper articles. Uh, here in Canada, we're finding that our military is being used more often uh, with regards to responding to these types of uh, severe events. And uh, certainly the uh, quote from the newspaper here is that there are more of our servicemen being deployed uh, here in Canada rather than over seats and that's certainly a, a switch in the way that our, our military is being utilized and even more local here with the Great Lakes uh, this is uh, some uh, footage or some uh, uh, photography from the London Free Press uh, dealing with the Lake Erie high water level and the impact on a, on a neighborhood and certainly the water levels of the Great Lakes are not associated with sea level rise. So that is the one uh, aspect that is not affected by the Great Lakes, but certainly the variability of the water levels in the Great Lakes is impacted by climate change. And that is something that is being uh, estimated as being a, a higher range and a lower range into the future. So flooding in London is something that is not uncommon. We have had floods in the past, but what we haven't had is what we're calling these extreme events. One month of rain in two hours is very significant. Or as we say in the, uh, the monthly average, three times what you'd normally get. This is the July 2000 flood. The top left showing the forks and showing it being very 
um, swollen with water. Top right is what we call Elgin Lake. Uh, those of you that know the Elgin residents at Western, the parking lot in behind is in the floodplain and does have uh, flooding events occurring, which creates issues obviously for cars uh, trying to get in and out of those parking lots. Bottom left is Fanshawe Dam during the July 2000 flood. And if you uh, notice carefully the um, floating debris behind the dam, which in this case was, was very close to impacting the actual operation of the dam. So again, that is a, a significant impact to infrastructure. And the bottom right, Springbank Dam, and for those who are familiar, Springbank Dam is no longer operating because of damage and a uh, botched repair job, I guess I'll call it, with regards to the uh, uh, repair of the, of the dam gates. So again, flooding is not something uh, uh, we're not used to. This is from the 1937 flood. And this is an area that the houses actually floated off their foundations. And because of this event, the area was actually turned into a park. Uh, the houses are no longer allowed there. And this is the Watson Street Park, for those of you that are familiar with the uh, Wellington Street just on the south side of the Thames River. Uh, flash floods. You've seen this photograph already, but this is a, an indication that our sewer system it will not be able to accommodate the amount of uh, water very quickly that is coming and, and uh, being uh, dumped on our streets. And this is something that we're addressing by dealing with stormwater before it gets to the pipe and talking about things like low impact development and rain gardens. The other aspect is the winter flooding. Again, we're not seeing spring floods being the norm. We're now finding more and more winter events. And both the flood in February 18 and January 2020 were of the same magnitude of that uh, flood in 1937. Uh, what is good, good news, I guess, is since 1930s, we've had Fanshawe Dam constructed, we've had dikes constructed, so we do have flood control structures that uh, uh, allow those floods to happen without the damage from the 1930 event. The other impacts we make in an emergency is we know that it's going to have an impact on our, our food source and certainly our uh, uh, imported foods uh, costing more because of the impacts of weather and climate. Locally as well, our farming community is already having issues with the timing of seas seasonal uh, droughts and, and uh, rainfall, and this is expected to be into the future. When we start talking about health impacts, uh, Lyme disease that's carried by wood ticks is certainly something that showing in this map of Southern Ontario from 2019, the risk area, if we're looking at those yellow uh, areas on the map, London is not included in 2019 as a risk area. This map been updated in 2020 and we now are included. And Lyme disease is something that's a bacterial uh, disease which can impact uh, neurological um, system in, in people's bodies if not treated. So it is certainly a, a concern and something that we're seeing more and more vector-borne diseases with regards to the changing climate. So why the urgency, especially talking about the next 10 years? This is the global carbon budget which is trying to keep warming below 1.5 degrees. And what we're seeing here is the red uh, vertical line is looking at the constant emissions for nine years will use up the remaining budget, uh, carbon budget. And so this is illustrating that starting mitigation in 2019 requires about 18% uh, uh, reduction rate of, uh, of greenhouse gases. If we had started in 2000, it would have been a much lower, 4% uh, per year is what we're looking at. So every year, this graph is showing us that every year we delay, uh, we're having a, a, a larger problem, a larger uh, challenge with regards to our, our carbon budget and keeping the warming below 1.5. Why are we dealing with the question of 1.5 degrees C, because we're already at one degree warmer. This graph shows that we're already dealing with, regardless of which global climate model we're dealing with, we're already seeing that we're at a, a one degree warmer climate. And in that one degree climate, we're seeing these impacts, permafrost melting, uh, such as in, in, in the north. I mentioned the impacts in Canada are much more severe in the north. I happen to have worked in, and lived in uh, northern Manitoba, and certainly that was something that I, even I was noticing with regards to the permafrost and the activity uh, in northern Manitoba. Permafrost also, the melting of it creates methane, which is a greenhouse gas. So we're actually getting into a feedback loop 
of uh, warmer temperatures spurring on the permafrost um, um, thawing and, and methane being released. And this map shows an indication of the, the tipping elements or the tipping points, uh, the blue being melted, uh, melting ice because of our warmer weather, the red being circulation changes in the, in the weather systems. And I'll just point out, if we look at the Atlantic uh, thermocline here, the circulation change, that uh, is a, uh, a warmer water temperature, which is spawning more hurricanes. And the reason why we're seeing more, more frequency and more severe hurricanes that are coming and impacting the Eastern seaboard and the Caribbean. And last but not least, the green is showing the areas where our biomass is being impacted, whether it's the boreal forest in Northern North America, or whether it's the uh, coral reef, the barrier reef off of Australia, these changes are impacting again the, uh, uh, the 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 weather systems as well as some of our carbon storage. So impacts to London, you've already seen this uh, image before. It shows that we're looking for much warmer uh, hot days to the point where if we don't change our our greenhouse gases, we're looking at almost two months of days over 30 degrees. And what's important here is it's not only the day temperature, but it's also into the evening. And if we assume our past climates, when we have hot days, it cools off at night, that won't be the case into the future. They refer to it as tropical nights. And that is something that if you're in a high rise apartment with no air conditioning and you need open windows, uh, this will not have uh, that those actions won't be uh, uh, relieving that heat because at, in the evenings, it'll still be just as hot as it will be during the day. If we do uh, hit our targets and we are able to reduce the temperature uh, to below two degrees uh, increase, then we will be looking at uh, a slightly less, uh, only 42 days rather than uh, the 60 days before. So that is something that uh, will have a sh showing the, uh, the, the impacts in a positive way with regards to lessening the, the impact of our very hot days. So what can we do? Well, in short, we can do a lot. One of the, the five top things that we're using as our foundation is using local data and local information. And we know that there's actions already being done by many groups, many different communities. And those actions are, are ones that we need to document and to um, ad advance into the other areas of the city where they can be replicated. Uh, we need a commitment from business leaders and community leaders. We're already getting that, but we need, we need to see more of it. We already have a commitment from council in declaring the emergency and a growing recognition of the challenges ahead. So these are all aspects that again, uh, certainly Western plays a part in. So the things we need to do is, is more commitment. We need to provide a variety of action we need to capture people's interest where they are. We need to, we need to gather those types of, of, uh, of actions that really are meaningful to people. Uh, different people have different motivations, and we recognize that. It isn't just because it's an environmental issue, but it's, it's also looking at their values. And these are things that we're very much uh, exploring and, and making sure that we utilize to get the, the most impact that we can. Planning now to reduce disruption later, the estimates are that every dollar spent on adaptation today will uh, uh, reduce or uh, avoid between four and six dollars into the future. So it is definitely something that that will pay in the long term. We need to prepare to make tough decisions. These are these are daily routine uh, events that we're talking about jumping in a car, driving to get groceries? Are there better ways of doing it? Are there other ways of doing it that reduce our greenhouse gases? And last but not least, make this an everyday discussion. I just want to mention last week, there was a wonderful presenter that the uh, Department of Geography actually hosted, uh, Catherine Hayhu. And she is a climate scientist who's Canadian, but works in Texas. I believe it's the uh, uh, Texas A&M, if I'm not mistaken. And she's a wonderful presenter. And if you get a chance, uh, Google her. She has some great uh, YouTube videos. And her comment is the first and the most important thing we need to do is talk about climate change. It, we need to normalize the conversation. Everything that we do should have the discussion about climate change associated with it. So that's a, a really important next step that we need to, we need to start giving a lot of uh, thought to. When again, we look at London and our energy sources, 
if you look at diesel, gas, natural gas, and electricity, diesel by far has the highest greenhouse gas emissions. Thankfully, if you look at the bottom, uh, the blue area, it's only 10% of the energy in London that is being used in, in, in diesel as a use. By far the largest, 48% of our energy comes from natural gas, which is a lesser greenhouse gas emitter, and 33% comes from gasoline. So these are numbers that give us an indication of where we need to focus attention. Obviously, if we all drove electric vehicles, we would be eliminating much of the greenhouse gas, not total, but much of it. And these are certainly high aspirations, but we know that's not feasible. And I mentioned the e-democracy um, tool at the very beginning. These are the types of discussions and decisions that are part of that tool. So again, I, I uh, encourage you to check that tool out once we do have it on our website, which will be in the next uh, 10 to uh, a week to 10 days. So reducing energy costs actually is a benefit to our economy. And this graph shows that the, uh, the amount spent on energy in 2018 was 1.6 billion. And in 2018, we were actually able to avoid spending $160 million because of energy conservation measures. And if you think of the energy that we're using, none of it is created in London. Natural gas is not created in London. Oil is not created in London. So we don't have jobs uh, associated with those energies. So when we spend money on energy, that money is going outside the city of London. So when we save $160 million because of energy conservation measures, that money can be applied in London to our own local economy. So a very, very important factor when we start talking about the economics of energy conservation. And so whereabouts are we on the uh, greenhouse gas reduction? Well, in 2014, we met the targets of 6% below 1990 levels. And if we look at the green dash line, those are our target lines and circles. If we look at the red line, that's the actual emissions. And the dashed red line is a three-year rolling average. And what you'll see with that red line is it's going up and down pretty dramatically. That is related to weather. So if we have a really cold winter, we're using more energy to heat our homes. If we have a really hot summer, we're using more energy to cool, air condition our homes. So that is directly related to the weather patterns. So the dashed red line gives a little bit more of a, a gradual uh, trend line and a little easier to see where things are going. But this shows so far, 2014, we were actually able to meet primarily because of Ontario's decision to close coal fire. Um, plants. So our, our energy became much cleaner. By 2020, we are in the vicinity right now. We're analyzing the data from 2019, but we are in that area of 15% below 1990 levels. So one can say we are, we are on track or very close to it, which is good news. But again, looking into the future and trying to get to net zero by 2050, we need to be 37% lower than 1990 levels by 2030. And that's a 21% a decrease of what we're doing right now. So these are dramatic changes that we need to start making. And again, the question is, how do we do that? What's the best way to do it in order to get to 2050 and that net zero goal that we are, uh, we are, we are uh, aiming at with regards to uh, how we do that? And certainly, as in the green box illustrates here, we have to plant more trees. There has to be more green infrastructure. We have to consider that as part of our, our, our go forward. And also we need to start looking at engineered solutions. And obviously that should be an interest to the Western community and certainly the engineering faculty. And we look forward to the discussions about that with you. So again, just to re revisit a couple of things, I'd already showed a, a graph an uh, illustration that showed how cars and houses are by far the biggest greenhouse gas emissions in London. We also have this grouping of fleet vehicles, commercial buildings and industrial buildings, which is a significant chunk, but not as big as our personal vehicle use and our housing use. So certainly these are areas where we will be focusing our attention with regards to our climate emergency action plan. 
So what is the city doing? And, and by city, I mean capital C, the, the, uh, the people that I work for, our, our mayor and council, as opposed to the small C, which is the entire, uh, entire community. We are looking at land use planning. And this comes back to our planning document, the London plan. We realize that if we look at, this is the city of London boundary, for those of you that aren't familiar with this irregular shaped gray mass. And what we've done is we've looked at the uh, sub suburbs and identified where gas energy use is the highest, red being the highest use and blue being the lowest use. And if my cursor is sort of showing you the downtown area, which is right smack in the middle of this colored area, you'll see that our suburbs obviously is where the most energy is being used because of vehicle travel. People need to jump in their car to get downtown, to get to the library, to do whatever uh, uh, work related or, or otherwise. So this is not rocket science. We realize that suburbs are the ones that are creating a lot more greenhouse gases. So land use planning is definitely a factor in the, the move forward. Transportation is the other factor, very significant one. Uh, rapid transit or what's now being referred to as higher order transit. These are the ways that we can influence the way people travel. And making sure that we have bicycle infrastructure, which matches the desire or even exceeds the desire. Um, we are now looking at bike share programs. We are looking at scooter share programs. And I realize uh, Western has a bike share program already. These are the types of things that, again, we are wanting to marry the efforts of our different communities, including Western, with regards to our own community improvements, pervious paving like the left uh, showing down Dundas Street to uh, reduce the amount of uh, surface runoff to ease our storm sewers a little bit more. And uh, the bottom right hand uh, uh, picture is actually uh, the center uh, building is the London Clay Art Center, which did a deep energy retrofit and they are now, uh, their energy comes from geothermal which is, uh, again, something a little different in the city of London. So community improvements that reflect the climate change discussion that is needed is, is what we are uh, looking at and doing into the future. And making sure that our new communities that are being developed are walkable rather than garages showing the, the, the face of the building. The first thing that you see, we are now looking at buildings that are closer to the sidewalk, making it a much more enjoyable uh, walking and pedestrian uh, environment and a little less imp a little less focus on the vehicle, which is again a, a planning uh, uh, perspective, which is one that is being looked at in many different uh, communities and many different large urban centers, growing inwards and upwards rather than sprawling sideways. And this is what definitely is happening in, the, in our downtown London. Uh, a car free living, basically looking at getting all your amenities, getting all your services within walking distance. And looking at places like the intersection of Richmond and, Ma and uh, uh, Fanshawe where Masonville Mall is and replacing these types of parking lots and, and uh, areas and, and focusing uh, more on transit, what we've referred to in the London plan as transit villages. So car free living also in the suburb, you're able to live here, you're able to jump on a high order transit and get you down without having to rely on, on personal vehicles. Now, of course, some of these areas are, are receiving some pushback and these are examples in both North London and in the Soho area where these types of high rise um, uh, residential units uh, don't always uh, receive the, uh, the, the, the thumbs up coming from everyone who lives in that area, but with the knowledge and with the vision of what we're doing with the London plan and also with the uh, climate emergency action plan, these types of discussions will hopefully be easier and, and be able to uh, show the benefits much more easily. London is the forest city and certainly our tree planting strategy, plant more, plant it in the right place. These are all efforts that are being done uh, with uh, more staff and more resources, which is wonderful to see. We're now moving into uh, private homes, making sure that private properties are actually able to access tree planting if they so desire to increase our tree canopy. Many areas of city are actually, uh, the tree canopy is aging and we know that we need to replenish those trees by planting now so that we get the benefit of it in the next 50, 50 to 100 years. 
The other aspect I'll just touch on really quickly and as we uh, come to the uh, close here, uh, food waste is something that is often overlooked. And as this graphic shows that if food waste, global food waste was a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after the US and China. Huge impacts in our own landfill shown in the blue, we capture 66% of the greenhouse gases, but there is still 34% that is released into the atmosphere. Of that 34%, over half, almost 70% is from food waste. So that is significant and is a big effort at the city with regards to green bins and, and composting. So what can you do to reduce your impact? Project Neutral, I mentioned, it's a way of estimating and, and analyzing your own greenhouse gas emissions from your household. And I uh, encourage you to try it out. If you were to try it out, this is the type of results that you would get. You'd get your emissions broken down into home energy, daily transportation, food emissions, and waste emissions. And you'd have a comparison with the top 30% as well as what the average Londoner has. So this is using London information and is a very good tool for doing that. At home, we, we've already touched on this, but I can't, re I can't enforce it uh, enough with regards to our, our own vehicle use. Huge impacts on greenhouse gas, our home heating and cooling, as well as water, uh, hot water heating, and our food waste. Those three alone make up the massive amount of our, our greenhouse gases from the household level. So what can we do? Turn down the temperature, don't uh, waste food. These are these are the easy steps that can give you 10% reduction right off the bat. If you're looking for more like a 30% reduction, drive less, use other modes of transportation, or, or perhaps a smaller car. If you're really after the larger aspects of reduction of greenhouse gases, a 40% reduction will be achieved if you start looking at more insulation in your house or maybe even switching out your furnace. And if we're really getting into the higher uh, deep energy retrofits, 55% if, if you switch to a plug-in electric and, and again, start using alternative uh, transportation. And the net zero, we're talking electric vehicles and deep energy retrofits at the house, including solar panels. So again, these are just examples of where different people at different uh, stages are at with regards to the conservation uh, aspects and activities. And if we look at household energy versus food diet, this is a lot, very surprising to many people that the choices we make on food is actually greater than the space heating that it, we have in our homes. So that is something that again, just very quickly, we've got impacts of food, both from the production side of it, to the uh, animals that are uh, grazing, to the transportation, and to how we deal with our food waste. These are all aspects with regard to the impact of, of what we choose as far as eating. And for those of you that may be uh, vegan or uh, choose uh, organically, these are the examples of our, our, our choices with regards to uh, the green showing the production emissions of beef, lamb, cheese, all the way down to lentils at the far end. Again, these are extreme examples, but show really the choices that we make. So our, our last two slides showing what you can do in the next 24 hours, you can determine your own carbon footprint by using Project Neutral. In 24 days, you can start looking at your driving habits. And in 24 months, you can start looking at those larger impacts and start figuring out whether these are types of things that uh, you wanted to do right away or look into the future. And these are obviously the ones that we're hoping people will, will uh, consider. Preparing for the impact is my last slide. And I think given the time, uh, Reza, I will end it there with regards to impacts or certainly we need to start thinking about um, uh, power outages and we need to start thinking about floods and that is a, an aspect that we will be dealing with also in our climate emergency action plan. So on that note, I will close and uh, help answer any questions that you may have. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pat, for your very interesting talk. Uh, we have many questions and I will go through them one by one. Um, I just wanna ask the first question myself. So with regard to the adaptation side, 
Um, you talked about uh, changes to the uh, you know, road covers and you kind of touched on low impact development, but are there, what are the serious uh, like uh, projects that you're currently working on or you plan to work on in the future with regard to adaptation? Yeah, great. A great question. Uh, low impact development uh, includes such things as rain gardens, uh, bioswales, pervious pavements. And these are the things that we're now working into design guidelines, for example, that the city has. So rather than them being pilot projects and demonstration projects, they are now working their way into the sort of normal uh, way of doing business. And we have a, a, a very good partnership with the uh, conservation authorities and their training, Upper Thames River Conservation Authority has done training on the uh, contractors and landscapers in the city who are actually able to now uh, speak intelligently and utilize some of those tools. What we're finding is that we cannot go in and, and replace storm sewers and upsize them in, in all areas of the city. Obviously, there's opportunities to do that. But what we're finding is we need to deal with the perviousness of our city. And basically, that's something that is a challenge when you're talking about shingles on roofs and, and pavement. So it, it sounds like it's a small thing. Uh, Risa, but it's actually a fairly significant thing when we start talking about the impact on our storm water system. And uh, certainly the work that's being done in the Dingman watershed, uh, there's a, a wetland that was constructed from a farm field basically, and it is one that has uh, flood prevention for the Lambeth area. It has uh, the ability to store carbon and it's actually uh, providing habitat for uh, many different types of wildlife, including some uh, uh, blue winged teal is a bird that is nested in the area and has uh, attracted quite a bit of attention from the Canadian Wildlife Service folks. So those are the uh, stormwater related. We're also looking at, of course, our, our dikes and dams. Conservation Authority is having to uh, analyze or review how the dams are operated when we start talking about different seasonal impacts of flooding. Uh, I mentioned winter flooding, and those are types of things that usually in the in the fall, there's a drawdown of the dams, and that's something that is a practice that has been um, uh, basically uh, analyzed for the last many decades. The conservation authorities across the province are starting to look more carefully at the practice and whether whether that gets us in good shape for the next flood or not. Um, dikes are something that we're also taking a closer look at just because uh, some of the dikes like West London Dyke is being increased in height, but it doesn't matter what height we actually put things to. We know that there's still that percentage chance of it being overtopped. So we need to look at other um, quick remedial ways that we can boost some of the dikes. And that's actually uh, one of the projects in the city studio, which uh, we've uh, provided the, uh, the engineering department with a, a proposal for. So these are the types of things that we are definitely looking at. But London is a river city. We have 43 kilometers of Thames River and we've got 85 kilometers of open creeks and ditches. So we do know that the water um, management will continue to be a, a challenge for us into the future and one that we're, uh, we're, we're closely looking at and looking at ways of improving our management of it. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, a question from Arafat. Uh, what if all vehicles were Tesla the greenhouse gas will be reduced highly. This should be a new law in the future. All vehicles should be environment friendly. Yeah, I, I'll yeah. be happy if you give me the money to buy Tesla. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, there's pickup trucks now too that are uh, uh, electric. Um, and a great question, and one we do frequently get. The City of London has no control over what vehicle you buy. What we look to is upper levels of government. Uh, our, our provincial government prior to the Conservatives did have a, I think it was $14,000, if I'm not mistaken, or, or is a considerable amount to reduce the price to an electric vehicle. That incentive was removed with the, the, the Conservative government and certainly is something that makes a huge difference. So yeah, as uh, Reza has already mentioned, we don't have money laying around to, to incentivize that, but upper levels of government do have the ability to do that and that is something that um, we 
part of our climate emergency action plan. We do have recommendations for upper levels of government with regards to how they can help us. And we are taking every opportunity we can to make sure that they know that through many different programs. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. A uh, question from Omer. Uh, does the city have any future plans for diverting organic waste from landfills? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, our, our plans are a green bin program. And we had that on schedule for next year. And I believe the latest information is because of the, the COVID pan pandemic, we've had to delay that for another year. But our council did approve a, a green bin program, which means taking the organics from your curbside and, and not taking them to the landfill to create more methane, actually creating compost and using it for, as, a, as a resource, basically uh, similar to other municipalities like Hamilton and Toronto. So it is, it is in the works and that is something that uh, we are uh, uh, anxiously in, uh, awaiting, but it's something that was uh, delayed because of the, uh, the pandemic. So the good news is it's coming. Excellent, thanks. Uh, question from Tarim. Does London have any plans to improve the cycling networks, specifically during winter months? Often sidewalks and more often bike lanes are not plowed or maintained during the winter, making the alternative commuting during winter months challenging. Yeah, great question and, and very much appreciate that question. Um, infrastructure is increasing and you will know uh, from the, uh, uh, the new twin bridges, I call them, uh, behind the uh, St. Peter's Seminary and King's College. We have that new connection of our uh, uh, cycling trail that goes from uh, Richmond Street all the way over to Adelaide Street. So the good news is, yes, that was a, we call that the missing link for many years. And it was probably in the books for the last couple of decades. Winter maintenance on the uh, multi-use trail is, is, is always a, uh, what should I say? It's always a, a point of contention because we do know that there is a desire for that. And I appreciate the question and I encourage you to uh, use your voice to make that, uh, make that aware. Uh, it is a, a costly, obviously, uh, expenditure to, uh, to snow removal for those areas, especially during, as we see the storm, uh, storms brewing across Lake Huron and the streamers that are gonna be coming. Uh, we know that the cycling community is very, uh, very much vocalizing that, uh, that request. And I believe, I can't remember the exact dates, but I think in the past we have uh, done a snow removal and because of budgetary probably, uh, it, was, uh, it was removed or, or reduced. Uh, the other aspect is the hierarchy. You know, our, our emergency routes and our bus routes are probably the higher um, hierarchy with regards to snow removal. And where does cycling lanes and cycling infrastructure fit in that hierarchy? I don't have the answer in that, but I don't think it's as high as where we'd, where we'd like it if you're a cyclist. So yeah, it's, it's a great question and it's one that is on the, uh, on the list of uh, issues for us to deal with. Because if we're wanting more cyclists and we're wanting them all season, then definitely a snow removal has to be part of that uh, aspect. The other aspect I'll just mention is there are some areas like Edmonton where they've actually put heating coils under the concrete on some of their uh, sidewalks and, and all-purpose trails. And so they're actually not having to do as much snow removal because of the fact they've actually got uh, that uh, uh, implementation to uh, reduce the amount of snow. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, question from Vinay. How can we make the transition to net zero emissions when we still have industries such as concrete production that produce high greenhouse gas emissions? What can we do to capture those emissions? Yeah, great question. And certainly um, uh, industries in London are, are very uh, small, I'll, I'll say, with regards to greenhouse gas emissions, but still knowing that, you know, we're part of the larger community and greenhouse gas has to be reduced um, nationwide, if not globally. A good, good question. And what we're looking at is the green development standards for new development. Uh, concrete is not uh, uh, the uh, always the way to go. And I think uh, Western has something like 13 Leeds buildings, I believe on campus. So uh, uh, that was a, a, a factor in the Leeds evaluation. I know the uh, Conservation Authority uh, office 
at uh, uh, Fanshawe, uh, wood was used rather than concrete. So the development standards are actually becoming more and more uh, stringent on that. And I think we will find uh, less of a uh, focus on concrete for some aspects and, uh, and certainly where it's uh, um, required in, in some of the infrastructure, it will still be occurring. But recognizing the impact, greenhouse gas impacts of concrete is definitely part of this conversation that we're having uh, with regards to the uh, Climate Emergency Action Plan. And I'll just mention, these are great questions. I encourage you to take uh, the time to uh, access our, our information and our survey on the uh, uh, London Get Involved site, just because these are ones that uh, we would be uh, very much uh, appreciative of having those uh, documented as part of that. Yeah, for Over sure. You, sure, thank you very much. Uh, so Mohammed has a question about the engineering, the structure of the engineering departments and whether there is like a structural department for bridges, buildings, environmental department for water treatment, flooding, infrastructure department, or is it uh, only one big department and all these departments are working together? Um, and Sorry, there's a follow-up question. Does the council oversee these departments or the city manager or the mayor? Yeah, great question. Yeah, certainly uh, uh, where I am, I'm in environmental programs, which is a multidisciplinary group. We are in the uh, uh, environmental and engineering services department, which is uh, uh, the, the, the boss of that is our city engineer. So I do sit in an area where the city engineer is our, is our boss. Uh, we do have many different uh, divisions, wastewater, stormwater, drinking water, uh, transportation, uh, environmental programs. And so we do have different divisions looking after different aspects and certainly depending Depending on what the project is, there will be uh, communication, obviously, between those uh, those groups as well. Uh, construction admin is the other aspect. They're the ones that are involved in larger projects and administering those those projects. And and certainly, like like any large organization, similar to the university, uh, you know, we we don't have it perfectly with regards to the communication between those different uh, groups. But one of the roles of our environmental programs division where I sit is to facilitate those discussions and making sure that we do have that, that cross pollinization with regards to ideas and also implementation. Just as, as an example, my background, as you uh, noted in the intro, is that I'm an environmental planner. Uh, we have one other planner who is a transportation planner in our section. And then the other uh, two uh, professionals are both engineers, one in the area of uh, uh, corporate energy conservation, and the other person are community energy conservation. So we have two engineers, two planners, and one staff person, which is directly involved in outreach and all the activities that we're involved in to get the uh, communication out to our communities. So there's an example of a multidisciplinary group that uh, is basically at the beck and call of all the different departments, not, not only in engineering, but also in our planning department. And one other thing I'll just point out while I got the opportunity, the Climate Emergency Action Plan is a marrying of the two, both planning and engineering. And we have very, uh, just met with uh, this morning, actually our fire services folks just to talk about their role in, in the climate emergency and some of the decisions they're making. And one of the tools that we're developing, which is very interesting, int uh, a lot of municipalities are interested in, is a um, screening tool. So all projects that the city is undertaking will have to go through an analysis, very, very brief and, and cursory, but what are the impacts, greenhouse gas impacts, and what are the adaptation impacts? And that's a screening tool that council asked us to put together so that we have that moving forward with all the projects into the future. So it's a, a very um, effective way of making sure that the climate discussion, I think I mentioned earlier, make, uh, you know, um, uh, that is something that will be part of all the decision making, certainly the major decision making and, and uh, making incorporating it into our, our framework. Very interesting. Thank you. A question from Yasser. I want to understand uh, something based to what it was announced in news last a few days. Prime Minister announced that government targeting to reach gas emission to be zero by 2050. In Toronto area, there was sidewalk lab project. What we can do for our city to manage the expected rapidly growth in population 
and need of new homes, which means more gas emission and pollution. Do we have a similar plan to sidewalk lab or something we, can, we could include in the city building permits and construction code? I mean, the solution for what we expect in near future. Yeah, that kind of a long yeah. question. Uh, you got that's, it. No, that's great. And, and it uh, ties back to the London plan, which I mentioned uh, was uh, finished about three years ago, I believe. And uh, it is something that directs the inward and upward growth and it is something that will be, um, it, it, it is the, um, the guidebook for new development and basically all new development has to abide by that. And we're already seeing that in downtown with the high rises. Uh, we're already seeing it in the Masonville area. You know, there's quite a bit of uh, new construction going on on the um, west side of Richmond up near the intersection. Again, this is all part of the transit village idea. So we're creating nodes, four nodes in the city, which were uh, intensifying development so that people living there have easy access to higher order transit so that we're not relying on vehicle use, making our, our city much more diverse with regards to active transportation, being at cycling, being at um, uh, carpooling, and also looking at our transit system and making sure that it is as efficient as possible where people need to go. And obviously that includes our industrial area, uh, the bus route out to the uh, Conservation Authority, which has a brand new intersection with lights if you haven't been out there. So these are all the changes that are part of this London plan plan and specifically your your comment about net zero and the federal government I, I i won't speak to that just because that's not my area of expertise but i know our staff are very closely watching not only what's happening in ottawa and in uh, in uh, in, uh, in toronto but also the uh, the, the uh, president elect in the states just made some very encouraging announcements this morning on the next steps for his administration, which is something that obviously because of the Canada US relationship, it will have huge impacts on the way we are operating in Canada, uh, right from appliances being, you know, net energy efficient, uh, that's not the right term, but you know what I mean, um, and even uh, further oil exploration in the north. These are all very important decisions that will positively impact Canada. So uh, yeah, we're, we're very much uh, aware of and watching closely what the different decisions are being made at the upper levels of government. So I know I, did, I didn't answer your, your answer, your question directly, but I think hopefully you can see where I'm going with land use planning, green development, uh, strategy is something that is being part of this community, uh, climate emergency action plan. So we will have more and more in our policies for new development to be uh, uh, checking the box with regards to green aspects, low G GHD, and also uh, adapting for the, the changing climate. So those aspects will be embedded in the uh, green development standards, which are coming into the future. Um, thank you very much, Pat, and thank you all. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, more time to continue. There's a couple of more questions left. So I hope, really hope that we will have you again, Pat, in the near future to give another talk related to your uh, current and future projects and hopefully answer more questions. Uh, thank you again very much. It was really an interesting talk and we enjoyed that very much. Uh, thank you. Good stuff. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. We'll see you next week.